God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I am very, very honored, delighted to be with you. I uh, look forward to this very much from the very first time that my handsome brother, the Grand, extended the invitation of God's direction. I uh, have never worshipped in a setting like this, so the experience is brand new to me and I thank God for it. I'm particularly delighted that he has faithful sons and daughters who, regardless of circumstance, remain faithful to God. God has a lot of people who give him lip service, the very few who give him heart service. And so I am inspired by your presence. I thank you for coming. I'm supposed to be done by nine, maybe quarter to nine. But I want to know what countries are represented. India. India. God bless India. I've been to India twice. I look forward to going back. Mumbai, Mosul, Pune, Bangalore, or the old version, Bangalore. Okay, Ghana. I've been to Kumasi six times, and I'm going to February, uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. God bless Ghana. All right. Uh, so we have India and Ghana. Is that it? Yes. Oh, where? Oh, the Philippines. Mabuhai. Yes. I, uh, I've been to the Philippines 12 times. I'm going back in February of 2016 to Victoria, Tarlac. Or Tarlac, is that what it's called? The Borokai, Siki, Hor, where all the witch doctors are, they tell me. Talisaya, Desaias, Digos, Davao, General Santos, Sagai City, Sri Lanka, all over the place. I love the Philippines. If I had the money, I'd buy one of the islands. All right. So we have uh, India, Ghana, Philippines. Kenya. Kenya, how about us our sequel to the reality? I won't go out about it. Ah, man, all right. That's between him and me. Don't ask me for translation. All right, so we have India, Ghana, Philippines, Kenya, South Africa. Uh, uh, I don't tell me, South Florida. How are you? I love South Africa. I want to buy the whole country. I don't have the money. But I love, I love South Africa. I've done meetings in. Uh, Grimstown, Rhodes University, uh, Vich University, University of Cape Town, in Kimberley, twice to uh, Port Elizabeth, uh, Brixton twice, Santon, uh, I just love, love South Africa, beautiful country, welcome, nice to see you. Yeah. South Africa, uh, South Africa, South Africa? No, all right, okay, all right, what's next? Zambia, Zambia. Zambia, I've been to uh, Zambia three times, love the place. God bless Zambia. What other country? Liberia. I've not yet been to Liberia, but God will take me there one day when he surrenders. God bless Liberia. On Rovia, I believe. Okay. Any other country? Nigeria slash UK. Nigeria. You can get me from two places. Nigeria. I've been there twice. I look forward to going again. UK, I've forgotten how many times. I have been to England, Wales, Scotland. Thank God for that. Any other country? Zimbabwe, love Zimbabwe, been there twice. Harare, Agueru. I'm going back to Harare 217 for a citywide crusade. God bless Zimbabwe, the children of Gobengula. All right, uh, any other country? We've exhausted all the countries of the world. All right. We get more tomorrow. Huh? We get more tomorrow. Oh, more tomorrow. All right, to guarantee that. Okay. I'm from the United States, originally from Barbados, but most of my life in the U.S. So I bring you greetings from all the believers in the United States, particularly the state of Michigan, the very first conference organized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're very proud of that. It doesn't make us holier than anyone else, but we're just proud of that historical fact. All right, before I begin, do three favors for me. They are all easy. Number one, all phones off. All phones, turned off. All phones, Nokia, Samsung, iPhone, all of them turned off. Yahoo, Google, makes your phone. Phones off. A phone is not a Bible. 
Somebody say amen. amen. A phone is not a Bible. This is a Bible. That's a phone. Okay. But if you need your phone because your Bible is on, keep it on, but turn down the sound. Are you with me? Yes. You don't need sound to read the Bible. Second favor, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And say, so, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That's based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I want to speak God's words and not mine. And the third favor I ask is that you think as you listen. Think. And may I have to ask for full favor that I should be the only one talking. Do I need to ask for that favor? No? All right. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father, our God, we thank you for life. We thank you, dear God, for the gift of worship. We thank you for the freedom to worship in this capacity. And we thank you, dear God, for the presence of your Spirit, through whose agency, Father, this worship experience will be acceptable in your sight. Look into our hearts, dear God. If we've sinned against you, forgive us through the blood of your Son. Now grant to us wisdom, grant to us light, grant to us knowledge, dear God. But above all, draw us closer to your bosom, I pray. Protect us from harm and danger. Give me the words to speak, Father, as I humble myself in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake, let God's people say, Amen. amen. And amen. Our subject for tonight, a God who plans ahead. What did I say? A God who plans ahead. Go with me to John chapter 6. We'll read from verse 1. John chapter 6, reading from verse 1. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. John 6, reading from verse 1. It's 23 minutes after 8. I have until 9. Now keep that deadline. That deadline. Do you have John? You may answer me. Do you have John? Yes. Chapter 6. Yes. Verse 1. Yes. You may read it if you choose. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was not. Verse 5. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now look at verse 5 again. He saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Look at verse 6. Read it with me. And this he said, go on, to prove him why. For he himself knew what he would do. Stop. Verse 5 tells us, when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. Now they were in a desert place, according to Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, and Matthew 14, where that story is also recorded. It is the only miracle found in all four Gospels. They were in a desert area. Actually, in Mark chapter 6, from verse 35, they said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far spent. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages, and buy themselves meat, for they have nothing to eat. So it was a remote area, a desert place, and the disciples told Christ, Send the multitudes away. That's what's going on, according to John. And so Jesus said to Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Verse 6 tells us, this he said to prove him. And the glorious ending of that verse, for he himself knew. Finish the verse. What he would do. What's our subject? A God who plans ahead. Here is the scenario. Jesus Christ knew 
there would be a crisis of food. He already had a solution for the crisis before the crisis arose. He chose not to let the disciples know because he had to test them. And so when he said to Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? <coughs> he was testing Philip. But you need to understand, you serve a God who always has a solution for every problem you will face. Now when I say every problem you'll face, as you walk in God's way. <coughs> Let me say that again. As we walk in God's way, God has a solution for the problems we will encounter. That crowd, that multitude was in the desert to listen to God, to Jesus. That's why they come. Therefore, their needs became his business. Am I talking to myself? No. You're listening. Yes. Let me say it again. Their needs became his business. Amen. Why are you in Qatar? Don't answer me. Let me guess why you're not. You did not come looking for greater religious freedom. <coughs> you did not come to find a wife. Or husband. You did not come for a better educational system. You came for one reason. Economic benefit. <coughs> now if I'm right, don't tell me. Now there's nothing wrong with that. But you need to understand that the God you serve had a plan for you before you landed in Doha. Amen. You see, God does not, God cannot be surprised. God cannot be ambushed. <coughs> if I walk through the door and someone's waiting around the corner, the person jumps and yeah, I jump. I'm startled. You can't do that to God. God sees around every corner. He knows what's behind every bush. And so when you were planning to come to this place, God had a plan for your life while you were in this place. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Which means that worrying and being ridden by anxiety is not God's will. You serve a God who plans ahead. Let me show that to you more dramatically, but less obviously. Go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, we'll read from verse 1. Our subject, a God who plans ahead. You have Genesis 1? Is it your culture not to answer the preacher? Amen. Do you have Genesis 1? Yes. All right, that's what I want to hear. Yes. All right, what verse are we reading from? 1. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Finish that verse 5. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Give me one word. What was God doing? One word. Like creating. creating. Let's go to verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament what? Heaven finished the verse, and the evening and the morning were the second day. What was God doing on the second day? Creating or working. If you read Genesis 2 verse 1, and on the seventh day God ended his work. Creation is work. So God was working. Let's go to verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, 
and the gathering together of the waters called, he sees, and God saw that it was good. He's created. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So God made the grass, the vegetation. He made the firmament. He made the light. You go to chapter, verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now God is making the sun, the moon, and the stars. He's working. Go to verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. God is creating the fish and the birds. Go to verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing after their kind, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. Here we have God creating again on day six. Now, let's review. On day one, what did God make? Day two. You're too slow. Is this an ad for this gathering? We're people of the book. Let's start again. Day one. Day two. Day three. Vegetation, dry land, okay. Day four. Day five. Day six, the first part of the day. Land animals. Now, let's go to verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have the wind over what? Over the fish of the sea and over the what? Fowl of the air going over what? Cattle over. All the earth and all every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And it was so scoffed. On what day did God make man? Keep in mind a God who provides. On what day did God make man? Question for you. Could God have made him on day one? Because he was the high point of creation. No, could he? Yes. But would they have been fresh water to drink? No. Would they have been fruits to eat? No. Nice air to breathe. A lovely woman to call his wife. Birds to enjoy. Flowers to smell. No. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 44, paragraph 3. Listen to Elwai. How I many of you know who Elwai is? I have to ask that in this part of the age. Okay, all right. Yeah. <coughs> page 43, paragraph 44, paragraph 3. Patriarchs and Prophets. After the earth, with its teeming vegetable and animal life, had been called into existence, man, the crowning act of the Creator, and the one for whom the beautiful earth had been fitted up, was brought upon the stage of action. What is she saying? When God had put everything in place, that's when he made mankind. Now, the way God works physically is the way he works spiritually. That's why Jesus' teaching was mainly how? By parables. Christ could say the kingdom of heaven is like unto something physical, three-dimensional, and then he makes a spiritual application. But why is that? This is the wife again, child guidance, page 45, paragraph 3. The whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. So next time you study Revelation, study it under a tree and see what insight comes to you. The whole natural world is designed. When you hear the word design, you know it's deliberate. You don't design accidentally. The whole natural world is designed by God, of course, to be an interpreter of the things of God. And Jesus showed the veracity of that statement by constantly using parables. Must you see, man who fishes, this, the next. A merchant man in certain pearls, because the physical has spiritual parallels now. At a physical level, God made, and he made man last. Why? Because he wanted everything in place for man's happiness. Then he brought him. God does the same thing spiritually. That's why 
people need to understand that about God and they'll be more likely to give their lives to Him. Because many people refuse to surrender to God thinking, if I give my life to God, my life will collapse. Not realizing that the God you serve is a God who has gone ahead and made preparations for your children. But you've got to follow His way. So in creation, we learn that God is a God who plans ahead. i tell you another reason why God created in that sequence. When Adam opened his eyes, he saw everything he needed. He said that there was something Adam could not say. All right, you're close. There was something Adam could not say. When he opened his eyes. And he said, what could he not say? What could God claim in its entirety? The credit for creation. Are you with me? No, you're not. Are you with me? Yes. All right, let's not argue on the Sabbath. God could claim all the credit for creation. Adam could claim how much? None. Every leaf he found, every bird he saw, every fruit it was there, every animal there it was, the air he breathed there it was, the water he drank there it was, the sunlight there it was, the grass that carpeted the ground there it was. He could claim credit for nothing. That's how God wants to work with you. God wants to bless you so abundantly. But in a way that you claim credit for nothing. And you gladly step back and give God all the glory for the blessings of your life. Again, I stress, if we walk according to God's will. Let me express to you differently what I mean. Let's go to Exodus 3. We're talking about a God who plans ahead. It is uh, 23 minutes to 9 by that clock. Exodus, what chapter did I say? Read for one verse. No, I didn't say that. From verse 7. My handsome brother from Ghana. From verse 7 of Exodus 3. When you've got it, say amen. Some of you still look like you're here the pages. It can't be that hard to find Exodus. It's book 2. If you have it now, say amen. From verse 7. And the Lord said, I have what? Surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have what? Heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster. Finish that verse. For I know stop. Something else we know about God. What was the first thing we learned about God tonight? Quickly, quickly. He plans ahead. He anticipates, takes action. He's not caught by surprise. The Red Sea was not a surprise for God. It was for the Israelites, not God. Sin was not a surprise to God. He had a plan of salvation before the foundation of the world. Let me slow down. We learn something else about God as you're in this foreign land. Finish verse 7 again. For I know this sorrows. Now, some of you, don't raise your hands. You're worried about things back home. You left somebody. At night you don't sleep well. You're burdened. Maybe there are children back home. They're not getting all the supervision they need. Maybe there's a spouse, some grandparent who's sick. Something has you troubled every night back home. And so God knows your sorrows. Are you listening to me? He knows what you're wrestling with. That thing that's giving you gray hair in your 20s. He knows your sorrows. Amen. And since he's a God who plans ahead, he has an answer for your sorrows. We must be intelligent about the God we serve. God is not a force. God is a person. Amen. He plans. He sees. He acts. Now let's go to verse 8. And I am come down to do what? To live them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land unto a good land and a large. Finish the next few words. Unto a what? And a land go on flowing 
with milk and honey to stop. When God said that to Moses, where were the Israelites? <coughs> In Egypt? Doing what? Suffering. With a capital S. Suffering. Did we not read the last part of verse 7? I know their sorrows, and I've heard they cry by reason of their taskmasters. You read verse 9, he talks about, I see the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. They were suffering. And God saw them. Listen again to verse 8. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a what? A good land, go on, and the large, go on, a land flowing with milk and honey. What God is saying, the land I have for them is already prepared with all that they need. They don't have to plan it. They don't have to build a house. The house is built. And Joshua tells them that in Joshua 24 verse 30. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities to dwell in which you built not, but the vineyards and the olive yards which you planted not to eat. You're living in houses you didn't build. You're picking from trees you didn't plant. Because God had that arranged for you while you were a slave in Egypt. We serve a God who looks down the road and he sees the difficulties you'll encounter and he makes a plan and every plan God makes is individual to the person. If you consider that in your hearts, it should reduce your anxiety, your worry, that cancerous fear that metastasizes, goes all over the body, cripples you, damages you spiritually. In this place, the car, God bless the car. Your God has already made a plan for you. Amen. You had a plan for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. You had a plan for Joseph in Egypt. You had a plan for Nehemiah in the court of Artaxerxes. God always has a plan for us. Because he is a God who plans ahead. But I must continue to add, for those who walk as God will have them walk. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 8. We read from verse 7. We'll be over in a few minutes. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We read from verse 7. Have it, say amen. Are we ready? Yes. Read with me. Yes. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee what? Into a good land. A land of roots, of waters, and fountains of depths that spring out of valleys and hills. A land of what? Wheat and barley and vine and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of oil, olive, and honey. Next verse. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread how? Without scarceness. Stop. What does without scarceness mean? <laughs> All that you need, you'll have. Read the verse again. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Next statement says what? Thou shalt not lack anything in it. Stop. Think. What is God promising the Israelites? I am taking you to a place where you will lack. How much? Keep reading. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayst dig brass. All the natural resources you need is in the land. The food you need is in the land. And of course, your protection is God. All God wants for the Israelites was obey. That's all. Just obey. I'll do everything else. I'll destroy the Amalekites, the Canaanites, the Cambodites. I'll destroy the Amorites, the Canaanites, the 
Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Gergesites. I will overthrow and I'll do all of that. You have to do one thing. Oh, baby. Listen to God speaking to Abraham, Genesis 12. Let's go there quickly. Genesis 12, we'll read from verse 1. Then we'll close. How many times have I said we'll close? All right. The preacher tell me say that five times. We're closing. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1. Do you have that? Finally, yeah. quickly, we have to wrap up. We really do. Now the Lord has said, now just, okay, let's read microscopically. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. All Abraham had to do was leave. That's all. But listen to God. We shall notice the pronoun I, and we shall put it in where it doesn't appear, but it belongs. Let's start again. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Then first, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What we see is an imbalance. All Abraham had to do was obey. God said, I will do all the rest. And so we read in Hebrews 11, 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a land which he would after receive an inheritance, obeyed. Everything else God did. My brothers, my sisters, you are in this land for a purpose. Let me shock you a little bit with this statement. You may have come primarily for economic reasons. There's nothing wrong with that, so would I. But if you believe the Bible as a literal book, you have to revise the major reason why you came in the light of the first Corinthians 10 31. Tell me what it says without looking. Whether therefore he eat or drink or move to Qatar. Now you finish the verse. Your presence in this place is first for the glory of God. Amen. Now, don't be nervous. The glory of God can be combined with economic success. <laughs> don't be nervous. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6 33? Tell me without looking. Seek you are first. Now, this is a divine recommendation about how to live an earthly life. Say it with me, but seek ye first what? The kingdom of God, go on, and his righteousness. Finish the verse. And all these things shall. Alright? What are all these things? School fees for your children. Money to buy build that house in Borokai. Or uh Pretoria. Or uh Insurance. Money to help your sick grandmother get proper treatment. God says, you put me first. And all these things shall be what? Without even having to ask. Ah, you didn't hear me. And we believe we've got to ask God for everything. If I don't ask for food, I'll start. No. What? God tells us, you just do my bidding first. Put me first. Make my kingdom your priority. You do that, and all these things shall be added. Amen. You know the greatest crime against God is? Unbelief. 
Listen to Jesus summarizing sin, righteousness, judgment, and sinning. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you, John 16, reading from verse 7, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. These three things. Now he summarizes of sin because they believe not on me. The foundation of sin is unbelief. And a lack of belief in God is equivalent to confidence in self. Not equivalent to, it is the equal and opposite reaction. And so Jesus says of sin, because they believe not on me. My brothers, my sisters, you serve a God you can trust. Amen. But does God have a people he can trust? Can he trust you to honor the Sabbath? Can he trust you to return a tithe while you're saving to build that house? Can he trust us to return that tithe? We can trust him. God wants a faithful people right in this place. Amen. Because the greatest evangelistic effort is a faithful life. You can't preach it then, as we do in the Philippines, United States, God, you can't do that. But are we not tabernacles? Are we not tabernacles? Yes. Pitch this. This is a tent in which God dwells, as verily as the tabernacle in the wilderness. Pitch this. And let this be the tent from which you proclaim what you believe. Pitch this. Hey. Represent a God who has your future in his hands. And so tonight, I appeal to you as your brother. Look at your life. Look at the reason why you are here. And ask yourself, is God pleased with me? He wants to be pleased. Always understand that God thinks no evil of you at all. This is God's words. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace not of evil to give you an expected end or a bright future. Listen to God again. This is a description of love. Love thinketh no evil. Here's love again. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. God believes you can be faithful. Amen. <laughs> you didn't hear me. I said God believes you can be faithful. Amen. Not because of your power, but because of the power he make available to you. Hey. Tonight, I ask God to keep me fishing. Wherever I am, the Tower of Philippines, United States, the moon, keep me faithful. Hey. Let faithfulness to God be my priority. How many of you will say, Father, give me the grace and the strength to be faithful in this place? Can I see your hand? Stand up with me. Head bowed, eyes closed. 